You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Priest, what's up? What's up, Andy Polk? How are you, man? Back here on the Shoe In Show. Back here on the Shoe In Show. Back, back, <laughs> back here on the Shoe In Show. Hello, Jasmine. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> Whoa. That's your favorite one. Hola. It is. She's bilingual. <laughs> when people answer the call me now, they say Hola. <laughs> you say Hola. Andy says Chow when he hangs yeah. up on the phone. Oh, okay. It's like the UN at our house, or at our office. <laughs> That's a good thing. That works. It's a great thing. Maybe. So, we're back at Epic. <laughs> yeah. We're uh, interacting with a lot of people all around the world. Yep. Jasmine may be inspired because the Made in Mexico booth is right next to us. Yes. She's probably picking <laughs> up some true. new words. <laughs> she is. Hola. Exactly. Hola. <laughs> <laughs> Palabra. <laughs> Which means Zapato. word. <laughs> Palabra. It means uh, mer- words. Yeah. Word. Yep. Uh, but Matt's been doing the rounds, and uh, we've got a lot of people concerned about trade. Yeah. And I don't know why. <laughs> I'm not sure. I didn't think trade was a big deal. Yeah. Apparently it is. Apparently it is, man. We get our products, two and a half billion pairs of shoes from another country. The Keebler Elves? The Keebler Elves. <laughs> out Bring of that right tree. In. Eel fudge. I want some Eel fudge cookies and I want a pair of shoes. <laughs> Can you combine those two? <laughs> I'm sure you have a soul of Eel fudge. <laughs> 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 Just eat your shoe. It's uh. delicious. But yeah, I, so I, I feel weird making these jokes in front of a steam professor from a, <laughs> a, a from an accredited university. Just ignore, like don't don't. Just don't look at we're having this. <laughs> look into my eyes, Matt. <laughs> this is what me. I do. Stay with me. We have executives on all the time that I make a fool of myself. <laughs> do you think I look at them when I make a fool of myself? No. I don't. You avert your eyes in shame. That's all right. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. My mom said, "You know what you're doing." She said that a lot growing up. <laughs> really? Mm-hmm. I thought she would have said, "You don't know what you're doing." Well, that she said that too. That I was a different. Too. <laughs> you were confused. Exactly. <laughs> but trade. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, we've got you know almost two and a half billion pairs of shoes yep. just coming into the U.S. Not even we're not even talking like global no, trade. No, not at all. That's just, just the into US, the U.S. Man. Yep. Millions of people making shoes and yep. and product and materials all over the world to, to to try to help bring those in, and uh, then we got people in Washington D.C. and. People in you know, uh, people in Europe and Brussels, and uh, people in Beijing, and that are not getting along for some no, reason. No, man, a lot of spats. A lot of spats. It's spats now. Let's hope that it doesn't turn into a war. Right. But uh, to help us kind of take a look at look at what's happening, both yep. in terms of you know what we're seeing with uh, with footwear and apparel and yep. trade yep. and all those issues and the, the dynamic issues of of those interjected with this kind of Spats, these political spats yeah. that we see. So who we got? We have uh, Dr. Shang Now Lu. you can look at him. Now I can look at you. <laughs> there. Dr. Shang Lu, who is a professor at the University of Delaware. Right. Blue Ham. Uh, Blue Ham. All nice. right. Worst mascot ever. And, no. Um, <laughs> That's so mean. Right off the bat. Uh, he's, uh. he's a professor. He's, you know, he's, 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 on, he's on the move. He's on, he's on to uh, other greener pastures later. But... Um, uh, Shang and I have been friends for a long time because of our love for trade policy, um, and I think you're the first doctor in our 120 episodes, to, other than Dr. Really? Bobby Campbell. Yes. <laughs> um, you're our, one of our first. Peter do- Noman. Oh, that's doctor. right. Our second doctor. Second. Second one. <laughs> um, so, welcome to the program. Sure. And why don't you give us a background on where you're from? Uh, because you have a unique perspective for the one of the trade spats that we're currently in, just based on your background, but also you have have long tracked trade policy and its impact on sourcing. So but lay it all on us. Tell us where we, uh, how you know. Tell us about you, and and let's go from there. Sure, I'm very honored to be in Shuing Show. Actually, I'm a liar fan to your. Oh, all right. <laughs> yeah. He's lying, but I like it. <laughs> He's already lying. Keep going. 
<laughs> come on, come on. <laughs> professor never lying. Um, <laughs> and I always say I'm the least fashionable professor in a, in a department of fashion apparel studies <laughs> because my favorite topic is trade uh, and trade boo, policy. Boring. <laughs> yeah, and also actually my background is very interesting. I'm not a typical fashion kind yeah. of um, graduate. My undergrad study is international economics and trade. Yeah. And uh, thanks to a great book called The Travels of T-Shirt and Global Economy, which Matt actually was featured. I got to know, oh, oh wow, text on peril. Um, it's not just about Project Runway. It's about, you know, trade <laughs> politics, about right. those re- you know, really interesting rules. It's about, you know, people's, you know, um, the poverty reduction, about, the, you, know, you know, trade politics, about yep. economic growth. I'm really intrigued. Yeah, and there is a saying: if you can really understand the trade policy for textile and apparel, and you can really deal with all kinds of sectors. Yeah, and then you know I'm really influenced by my advisor and by you know um, many interesting um, you know events in the world, you know, from um, the quota system to U.S. China um, textile safeguard measures, and then going on TBP. Yeah, you no, know, now no. Well, well, to be honest, I'm 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 really excited, and somehow I really feel um, lucky. Because it's such an exciting moment to look at Trey. Like I just recently published a paper uh, which look at what would happen to the U.S. textile power industry if NAFTA is gone. Right. I don't think I would have such a kind of chance to look at these topics. At least somebody's happy and excited. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the house is on fire, but yeah, you know, we're yeah, hmm, yeah. studying. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, and, and also a couple of years ago, I look at you no know, Jim's Pacific Partnership TPP. Yeah, you no, know, you no, know, for text on Those were the good old days. Yeah, man. yeah, good yeah. Old days. So this is really keep me. You know, um, what was the finding for the NAFTA study you did? What What does that look like? Um, one sentence: NAFTA matters so much. Yeah. yeah. NAFTA matters so much. Um, more specific, it's about over six, um, over fifty percentage of U.S. textile exports, and also a very important source of, um, you know, sourcing base for U.S. fashion brands and right. retailers. Right. So it matters. So, right. do not so you had a one one do sentence paper. Is that what you're saying? Oh no, no, just one t- uh, one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> it was a one sentence takeaway, Matt. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Right. Gotcha. Matt's looking to aspect, see how we can tell yeah. how we can trim down our own uh-huh. reports. Yeah, exactly. How can we be? Yeah. How can I be a published? Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah, that that's it does matter. That's the thing about these things. They they become uh, second nature because they've been there for so long, and you rely on them. Right. And most people think they're untouchable because free trade agreements are permanent in nature, permanent trade exactly. relations. Exactly. Then the moment someone starts touching it, we all well, realize that's. I think important. people too think that. Um, people too think that um, it, these trade agreements are like infallible. Right. So you have these laws, and everybody like it, if somebody starts cheating on these agreements, like. You know, how is this possible? And right. it's like, every, every, like you can set the rules of the road, but then you got to enforce it, right? Yep. So there's all that section that people, so I guess the Trumps of the world who, who see all, all these people cheating or whatever it is, it actually is just part of trade. Right. Cheating is a little bit part of trade, just like the rules of the road are part of trade. Just Carving like out your competitive is, advantage. You know? Yeah, I I totally agree with that. And when I um, introduced this concept to my students, I uh, I always make such kind of comments. There is really no absolute good or bad policy, but right. who are the winners and right. who are the losers? So right. this is why very interesting. Even if you think about textile and apparel, they're the same sector, but actually, the textile guys no. and apparel guys they really have very competing interests. They always disagree with each other. You know, for example, the very hot issue these days: the U.S. China through one section dispute. Yep. Yep, yep. Uh, U.S. fashion brands and retailers they really um, disliked the additional tariff, but. Very interesting. Uh, Nick Toll, the National Council of Textile Organizations, which represent U.S. textile industry, they ask for additional tariff. Right? Yeah. Why is that? You no, know, actually, their position really is shaped by their business interest. Yep. They want to protect the so-called Western hemif- uh, Hemisphere supply chain. Right. So basically, U.S. export yarn, yarn, and ta- uh, yarn and fabrics to. Mexico to Central American countries. Right. So the more uh, U.S. import power from these regions, the more U.S. can export textiles to these regions. Right. Yeah. So it's really intriguing, uh, very interesting, but really just showcase how you know interesting trade is. Even within, even within, like you take the yarn for this is getting really trade nerd right. real quick. But when you take the yarn for rule of origin that's in a in a trade agreement, even the the yarn guys love it. The fabric guys don't necessarily exactly, love it. Exactly. So there's even within textiles, not homogenous. Yeah, uh, uh, they don't have a homogenous perspective. So, um, what has been you've you've gotten to know the footwear industry in particular, um, and having had the opportunity to kind of talk to your students from time to time. 
Um, how do you view footwear versus apparel and kind of the differences that you've been able to view from an outsider? And then let's, let's talk about you're from China. We didn't really talk about that yet. And right. kind of I mean, your grew view. Up in Shanghai. Yeah, you yeah. grew up in Shanghai, mm-hmm. one of the world's greatest cities. Um, let's also pivot over to how you feel about sitting in America, hearing the rhetoric of, the, of what's going on from the American perspective. How, well, how would you forecast this all ends is another question. But before we do wow. that, talk about the differences you see between apparel and footwear. Sure. And before I share with my view, I would just want to say, you know, Economist has a bad reputation to forecast. Right. <laughs> yeah. So we kind of very good at um, analyzing at or you. explaining what already happened, but really <laughs> bad at forecasting what will happen. Like the weatherman. Well, actually, we're worse than that. Uh, <laughs> it can't them. be worse than the weatherman. My economists maybe have 10 different views. Uh. So this kind of a saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is um, that a Chinese proverb? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, I think, well, who knows? Maybe this is a very global kind of um, phenomenon. Um, yeah, I think it's really very interesting period of time. Yeah. Because, you know, and I will say there are a lot of misunderstanding or misprediction about President Trump's trade policy. Right. Strategy and well, actually, from day one, I personally have some different views. Sure, my you know, you know when President Trump took the office, um, kind of the mainstream view is you no, know, he's a businessman, right? This means he's very transactional based, so he's maybe you know, to you no, know, you know, kind of relatively easier to deal with, right? As long as he can see the business interest and he will you know, um, you know change his views, but but actually, on trade, just like Matt, you mentioned um, this afternoon. President Trump has you know, has been quite consistent with his trade policy. Right. And um, in my, you know, f- you know, I I keep tracking Trump's trade policy agenda from day one. Right. I really, you know, on all the, um, you know, you know, policy proclamation, you know, his action, you know, the U.S. tariff statement. Kind of, I think uh, Trump's trade policy really reflects three of his philosophy. Right. One is he really believes in mercantilism view, so which basically argues, you know, export is good, import is bad. Um, in comparison, economists mostly, you know, uh, support the view of comparative advantage. So instead of making everything by yourself, you should just make something you're good at doing. Right. And a second, I think Trump is really, you know, uh, you know Trump really attached great importance to trade um, to, 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 to trade deficit. Right. You know, even though, you no, know, you no, know, once again, from the economic perspective, you no know, trade deficits mostly influenced not by trade policy, but right. by the macroeconomic policy. Right. And also, there is no direct or very no uh, clear you no know, uh, relationship between and uh, no economic growth and a country's trade deficit. You now see when uh, was the last time when U.S. has um, relatively low trade deficits? It was back to 2008. You have the financial crisis, right? But nobody wants to go back to the financial crisis. No, of course right? not. And a third, I think Trump really you know um, believe in the power of the jungle rather than the rules of the institu- I mean, the power of the institution. Right. So this is why he always, you know, threatened to withdraw from FTA and or or even with you no know, threatened to withdraw from the World Trade Organization. Right. So this is my personal observation. And if you look at what has happened so far, it has been pretty consistent. Um, um, I mean, his actions really reflect these three principles. So I right. would think, you know, it could be really challenging, really challenging. You no, know, probably people should you know, prepare for a long, you no, know, relatively long term. Trade disputes between U.S. and China, and probably this dispute won't go away anytime soon. And you know, if you look at the trade data, and I, you know, I know companies or the media are really interested in the impact of such a dispute um, right. on our sector in particular. Um, very interesting. Um, I think in the short run, trade volume actually will go up. Yeah. And this is really uh, very similar to the case of U.S.-China um, textile safeguard measures back in 2005, because you know companies are really eager yeah. to you know uh, so use all the market, the, yeah, yeah, to mm-hmm. use all the quotas, and the same this time, and they want to fulfill their orders. Yeah. So this, so this is why it's very interesting. Like I look at the trade data um, this um, this May, mm-hmm. um, U.S. apparel imports from China went up by 7.7 percentage. Really amazing. Um, I think um, the June data shows, you know, even though year on year there's a, some slight decline, but um, month month um, by month it's still increased by over 17 percentage. Right. But I think you know the real impact will be 
maybe, no, maybe, uh, maybe t- um, by the end of the year or maybe um, early next year. Right. Be- because, you know, I, re- I recently did a study in conjunction with the U.S. Fashion Industry Association, which represents U.S. fashion brands and, re- and apparel retailers. Yeah. So we ask companies, you know, uh, from where you source your products, what was your latest sourcing strategy? And we see, you know, um, first of all, companies really concerned about the uncertainty yeah. created by the current, you know, kind of overall trade environment. And their strategy, their strategy is to diversify. Right. Yeah, it's not just because of cost. You know, I think there are a lot of misunderstanding, oh, made in China is becoming more expensive. But you look at the data, the average, uh, I mean, the, the unit cost of U.S. pair imports from China actually is going down. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, made in China actually is becoming more competitive compared to, you know, compared to made in Vietnam, made in Bangladesh. Why right. is that? Because China really has a very complete supply chain. Yeah. So you can really locally source your, your textiles, many apparel, and exports to the world. In comparison, the number one, the rising star of Vietnam, still have to import majority of his textiles from China. Right. So definitely this adds to the cost. Okay. Um, and also I think um, you know, um, you know, in the short run, you know, it's really hard to find China's alternative. Yeah, so this very time hard. very interesting. You know, I had a chance to talk to some vendors uh, you know, at, at, at the Magic. Um, both the Chinese and uh, some U.S. companies. Kind of, um, for the Chinese part, they're relatively confident. Well, definitely, they, they wish there was no such kind of trade dispute. Sure. But also, they say, you know, um, they're confident because they believe their competitiveness is not just about price. Right. It's about the product. You know, even though you may have you know, 25% of tariff, but if my product's good, you know, I, you know, I can still keep my clients. Mm-hmm. And the same with U.S. fashion brands and retailers. You know, even though you know, um, they try to source you know, from more places, but still, you know, China, you know, given its you know, overall cost of goods, its overall you know, speed to market, compliance, you know, risk of compliance, still it's very balanced sourcing destination. Right. And you can basically you know, source any product in any quantity in China, and there's no such replacement out there. So, yeah. very interesting, we find, you know, in our study, we find the current um, most popular source model for apparel is China plus Vietnam plus Maine, which means China typically account for like uh, like 11 to 30 percentage of their total source and value volume, mm-hmm. um, the same for Vietnam, and for the rest of the countries, each will account for less than 10 percentage. Right. So, it's more kind of, you know, diversified, sourcing based, um, in order to, you know, strike a balance. And I would say sourcing is more than just about the cost. It's about striking a balance. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. That's true. Um, so where do you think this is headed? And tell me how you view this as a Chinese person living in America. Are you getting questions back from your colleagues and friends back in China about mm-hmm. where is it? I mean, how, how, or kind of how are you viewing this from, from your perspective? Well, I'm more kind of um, more independent academic view. It's sure. In, I, I do not speak for Chinese or... Oh, kind come of academic. On. True, true. Because I really live in the states, and sure. I'm having back home for you know, for a while. And I think it's really, um, you know, academia really wants to be independent. Yeah, I'm more interested in you know um, seeing what actually happened than to predict what what happened. I think, sure. Matt, you're in DC, and you're more closer to these policymakers. You have more clear views. <laughs> I don't on what happened. But well, what about? Let's ask um, it in a different way. Then, what are Xi Jinping's principles when it comes to trade, and what what about the the Politburo and the decision makers of China? What are their principles when they look at these trade disputes that we could extract and get something? You gave us really good insights into what you think about Trump. You know, if, as we look to kind of see where this is headed, that's important. Yeah, but I think people in America have not heard that. You know, yeah. there's been some articles and discussions about um, economic slowdowns in China. And then you have articles, and, and, it, and it's hard to know what propaganda is and who's playing what angles politically, but you have some articles coming out saying there's splits in the Communist Party because some people are saying they're taking too hard of a line. Other people are saying, you know, they're actually very solidified in their approach to this issue and they're going to play the long game. So what, what are we to actually believe as independent thinkers on this topic? Yeah, um, I have two points to make. First, you know, just from my personal observation, sure. I think uh, compared to a few years ago, uh, the government is playing more and more important role in Chinese economy. 
or we put or we um, put it in this way: the state, the state-owned enterprises is is kind of having more influence in the economy. Mm-hmm. Um, second, I would say, you know, in the past, trying to always say to not politicalize trade issues, but this time, really, trade has become a very political and very sensitive issue. This yeah. also means the solution to the trade disputes is not by communist. Right. It's not by, you know, no, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, I mean, you know, how you suggest, oh, the cost of trade war, you right. know, both, you know, China and the U.S. may lose a lot, you know, if you have the trade war. But by the end of the day, the decision will be based on politics. Yeah. It's about, and also all foreign policy is an extension of domestic policy. Right. So do not expect President Xi Jinping to, you know, to, you know, to look weak. Right. Because of a deal, you know, with the U.S., well, and he definitely wouldn't do that. The same with President Trump; he has, to, you know, he has domestic constituents to, to, to kind of satisfy. Right. So this really makes um, the outlook of these trade bills very, um, very Damn. tricky. Very, yeah. very tricky. It's not based. You no, know, I, I think most of media currently say, okay, you no know, trade war will cost, you know, farmers' job, will cost the U.S. economy, but it's not. You no. Know, these economic factors are not the decisive factor. The well, decisive you know, factor, I think, is do politics. Well, I've heard, um, and you can maybe you can either confirm this or, or uh, refute it, but I've heard that the Chinese government has been muted in stirring up national fervor against American products, at least to this point, in response to what's going on. But there could come a time where they decide, look, you know, this is going to be a this is a nationalistic fight, and as a good uh, citizen of, of China, uh, don't buy Coke, don't buy Starbucks, don't buy um, Buicks, don't you know, do start to really clamp down, and and then this will get real ugly and yeah, to the detriment of the U.S. economy, big yeah, time. Yeah, I would say you know, nationalist is no, I mean the nas- the nationalist kind of um, mentality is a. You know, it's a growing concern right yeah. now. But also, I, I want to say, you know, um, I keep looking, you know, also looking at um, the statement by the, um, by Mofcom, the Minister of Commerce in China. Kind of, they're not really sure what to do. How yeah. to respond to the U.S. Right. No, it's different. You know, it's it's very different compared with say the U.S.-China um, textile safeguard measures. Right. Back back to 2005, when you have this kind of dispute, it's very clear. Yeah. Because of the regulations out there, okay. Right. If, you know, if um, China did not respond to the re- to to, um, to the request by the U.S., then after 30 days, right. the U.S. will automatically, you know, put a certain level of quota out there. Right. But this time, you no, know, kind of the Chinese government really not so sure how to respond. Right. You no, know, both kind of, you know, can, um, you know, have their voice be heard or be um, correctly interpreted by the U.S. counterparts, but at the same time, to not look weak. Once again, the bottom line is the Chinese government cannot be looked weak. Right, you know, right. By, you know, by their people, right. especially when the mentality is really kind of the, the nationalism pressure is going up. Yeah. Right. So, so um, that's everywhere. Really, oh a gosh. test. Really, like, a test of wisdom and courage of yeah. politicians and the leaders. Which is in short sides. supply on both yeah. on both sides. So. I th- it's just troubling that you got this nationalism being infused into economics. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and you've got, you're exactly right. The mercantilism idea is counter to what we've had from, uh, what it, who was it? Ricardo, right? The, the, the free trade system that we've had for several hundred years of comparative advantage, right? You can make something better than me. I can make something better than you. We trade on those goods. We don't compete on those things. Yeah, really. Adam Smith and David Right, David all this Ricardo. stuff. And it's kind of counter to that in many ways. And it's, it's um, on, from a U.S. perspective, what's really a challenge is uh, after World War II when we helped create the international system, we created a system whereby if you follow these rules, and of course we say everybody cheats, but if you follow these rules, everybody gains. Right. And it's strange that our president is attacking the very system that allows us to gain in strength as well as our partners who who abide within that, within right. a framework, right? Right. Um, and then the other, the other aspect is, and I think there's a strong concern, I think, from the Chinese perspective of, uh, um, I think... 
and I forget the term, but it's something like autarky, right? Are you familiar? Where it's like it's this nationalist view that people need to allocate resources from within and maintain control over their resource mm-hmm. uh, resource supply chain, so that the trade starts breaking down. And that idea is what led to uh, you know the world wars that we had was this idea of we we need to have better control over this and these these trade relationships aren't that important as long as right. we can control our own supply chains. But in this world, you got people who are in leadership positions thinking that, and they're not seeing down below all these different things. Like you know, here at Magic, you see it. You see people talking and interacting yep. and all that. Yep. And it's a shame that we don't have more public officials doing these shows and walking around to see that as well, to see from a, a granular level what that means and to help diffuse some of that stuff. But I, th- I think you're exactly right. It's a this is a political solution to an economic problem. And that's never a good thing because yeah. it does make it volatile. It do, because someone, both sides have to save face in some way. But who is who is that middle person? I mean, look at the North Korea U.S. thing. Who was the middle person? Was Dennis Rodman? That <laughs> creates a whole different ball game. If you're looking at U.S. trade, it's like who is that person who can work on both ends and say. Who's yeah, the logical? So who's Yao the adult? Ming is, do we need Yao Ming to come know, to the negotiations? It's the question of who's the adult in the room that can go and say, here's a good solution that will help the U.S. save face and China save face. And now we can actually sit down and talk about the economics. Right. right? Can like, I make a one point? Sure. Of Personally, I'm really interested in what's happening at the World Trade Organization, yeah. WTO. You know, mm-hmm. Even though it's not, no, not so frequently mentioned by the media and you know, the media always just focus on what the US government is saying, what the right. US government is doing. But I would say WTO is very important. Okay. And I don't think the Trump administration is totally giving up WTO. No, they're yeah. not. Very interesting. They're filing cases. Yeah. The, WTO. the filing cases in April, Chinese filed a case in July, US filed a case. Right. And according to the WTO rules, okay, if a party filed a case um, at a WTO there is a mandatory consultation process. This means even though you know, officially there's no negotiation between U.S. and China, but they have to talk to each other at the WTO. Yeah. And also, even if you know, the problem is not solved through the consultation process, the WTO will make a judgment right. by the end of the day. And this judgment is, um, is, um, uh, is binding to its members. And also, you know, I would say... On WTO itself, when you try to solve your dis- try to solve the trade dispute at a WTO, it's not as kind of confrontational right. Right, as a bilateral trade dispute. If you only sign a bilateral trade, you no know, trade agreement, it's, you know, you know, sometimes it can, you know, you know, can, you know, can be very sensitive or or, or really. Um, um, so you no, know, no, you, you can describe it as a trade war. But right. even if you have dispute at a WTO. And this is kind of a kind of routine thing, just like how we go to court. We want to solve this peacefully. It's just a um, no, re- no regular process. Right. It's, it's a mechanism It's a, it's a dual track strategy. So you're going to continue to do the normal, use the WTO. But Trump, the conflict is an important aspect, creating it out of nothing. Creating the conflict yeah. is an important aspect for his MO. Right. And also the tricky part you know, this time is... The current WTO rule is not sufficient to solve the claim right. by the U.S. and China. Right. So, so this is the tricky part. So, how can you use the WTO rule, that, which does not cover the current? Yeah. How do you deal or, with intellectual property right, protection right. through the WTO? And also, how to deal with state-owned enterprises? Right. And this is also why, to me personally, is very interesting that. Robert Lighthizer. No, Trump may have limited knowledge about trade, but he has you no know, Robert Lighthizer. He's a really trade guru. Yeah. And Lighthizer, I think, is doing something big at the WTO wow. to mobilize you know, some of like like you know, like the European Union, like Japan, to form some like plural kind of agreement to right. to to write some new rules that deal with like IPR, right. deal with um, state-owned enterprises. I think this is something we really need. If, no need to pay more attention to because by yeah. the end of the day, it's really rude that matters. Yeah, for you know, maybe not matters right now, but for the next administration, right. it'll matter it will have really long term impacts. Right. Some that's true. Really, some strategic implications. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I this is like this takes me back to my days at Otexa and talking about all these things, uh, Shang. So I appreciate you kind of coming in and Very giving happy your, to do because that. you are unique. Um, 
because of where you're from and now where you work mm-hmm. and your and your passion for policy and the impact because mm-hmm. we spent many years talking about trade policy and a lot of times people don't really care and now everyone cares yeah and we're glad everyone cares dang it so <laughs> <laughs> So with that, you know what's fashionable? <laughs> Caring about tariffs, right, Jasmine? <laughs> Not so much. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> I found a, something online on the GQ website. Uh, I think it was like last week. Um, and it, I'm scared to call it a trend, but um, it's saying that dirty sneakers are in, right? You can create a look with it as long as you have a very tailored, clean suit and a nice haircut. You can get away with dirty sneakers. Dirty. Sneakers. Yes. Now I thought about this. Now I don't like dirty sneakers, but I like my Converse is kind of dirty because it gives them a little character. Not the white ones, but other ones. So I was wondering if I was alone in that. Like, do you if if they get too scuffed up, are you throwing them away or donating them or what? Question: um, <laughs> Is this made dirty? During the initial production process, or is this dirty no. based on what you do and the normal dirty wear like there? yeah, like you're working yeah. and you're going to work and you're scuffing them up. Do you like to have your shoes with a little bit of character with them, or are you tossing them or donating them? Well, I remember as a kid rolling into school with like brand new white sneakers. People, yeah, I'm blinded. Oh, you gotta <laughs> dirty those up. So that may be part of it. But oh, that I'm was not- a joke then. That was like a real thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You're blinding me with your sneakers. <laughs> so maybe it's just come back around because the old is new again, right? Okay. <laughs> interesting. I like interesting. stuff clean. My you like shoes. your stuff clean? Okay. Yeah, my shoes have to be clean. I'm not particularly... I don't like scratches in my leather okay. shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If they're dirty, I'll I'll clean them in the sink or something like that. Yeah. Well, uh, well apparently they're promoting that. I don't know how you feel Chang, about little scuffed yeah, up what sneakers. Yeah, how do you feel about stu- scuffed up sneakers? <laughs> and what kind of shoes do you wear uh, when you're in the classroom? Yeah. Dress shoes, definitely. Yes. Dress, <laughs> dress up. You do? Or yeah, if it's not dress up, and people wouldn't treat me as a professor. Oh. Okay. <laughs> they, you, you don't want to treat you as a friend? <laughs> yeah, you just spell them. <laughs> you just teach them the rules of the road. Just Power like a trade. <laughs> I'm going to trade you this. You treat me with respect, or I'm going to give you an F. That's the trade Throw right there. Throw a beard. I can't. Wear I jeans. Can't. Wear dirty shoes, apparently, and you'll be, it's you'll not be fine. Berkeley. <laughs> it's not Berkeley. It's not Berkeley. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure if this is actually going to evolve into something, but but I'll be very interested to see if, if I see a little bit more scuffed up shoes with clean everything else. I don't know how I feel about do this you, one. Do you have a favorite uh, a favorite brand that you always like to buy? You say you're wearing shoes uh, in the classroom that are probably leather. So what, what kind of shoes do you yeah, like? Yeah, actually, not a particular brand for shoes, but for clothing, definitely is Tommy. Oh, yeah, uh, Tommy? Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. cool. We got to get him loyal to a footwear the, brand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you, you can rec- me, I mean, you, you can recommend me some uh, particular uh, Just particular go to the FDRA uh, member page, <laughs> scroll down the right, right? brand. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot on there. I don't know. Cole Han's one of my favorites. Cole Han is yeah. good. Yeah. You can That's rock true. some, like, more casual Cole Han that look yeah. really dressy. Mm, and it'll still, yeah, still look very professional. This isn't a uh, uh, <laughs> this isn't an intervention for you on the fashion side. You did say you're the least fashionable professor, <laughs> right? Yeah, this is our duty to help him out. This yeah. is Jasmine's duty. I'm not, I'm not involved. <laughs> She's got like a side gig going over here on the side. She's like using this show to promote her own uh-huh. fashion consulting uh-huh. business on the side. Getting jazzy with Jasmine. Uh, I like that. I, yes. could, I could deal with that one. You'll have to pay me a small You've fee. You've been pretty good. <laughs> oh, my God. Shane, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We're so pleased to be here. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us. Thanks for being a loyal listener. It's sure, I'll come to be, and yeah. we're looking forward to this episode as well. Yeah, <laughs> and if you want to incorporate this show into your uh, syllabus and force your students to listen, yeah. then Pop we quiz. will. We will not. Right? Post I will definitely, that. I will definitely put that in my syllabus. <laughs> That's fun. In a <laughs> Uh, folks, this is Shoe and Show. We're covering the ins and outs of the footwear business, talking about all sorts of things from product to retail. But uh, today we're talking specifically about trade, how we actually execute product, assemble product, and ship it all over the world. Um, if you have questions, if you have insights that you want to share from your perspective based on this, hit us up. If you have ideas for other shows, guests, etc., we're at shoeandshow.com. You can find our full catalog of, of uh, all our episodes over the past couple of years. Um, and you can hit us up on social media on Facebook or Twitter. Um, so with that, uh, you know, thanks again for coming and sitting down with us and, and chewing the chewing the fat on trade. And um, I think it, it was very insightful to see the Chinese side of 
I think you're exactly right on Trump and his his kind of principles of free trade. Um, and then also seeing the Chinese side, it, you know, it's, it's concerning that uh, an economic issue has turned political, but that's the world we live in. And so we all need to be more involved in politics to make sure that sanity is restored. So um, if you're not planning on voting this year, you definitely should. Whoever you vote for, go out and vote uh, in the U.S. elections. Um, but with that, Shuin is out. Shuin has been brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.